Hello everyone, this is Jen and I make useful English Lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary ideas and more to help you become a literary expert. So in today's video we are reading one of the most iconic confessional poems of all time and that is Sylvia Plath's Daddy. Now Plath is perhaps most notorious for her gory suicide. At the age of 30 she stuck her head in the oven and killed herself in an especially bad depressive episode. Sorry to start a video like this, but fact. For all her tremendous creative talents, Plath was an objectively tragic figure. Having struggled with manic depression for most of her life, losing her father at eight years old, being admitted to numerous mental asylums for the treatment of severe clinical depression, experiencing a turbulent and abusive marriage to fellow poet Ted Hughes, who cheated on her with a neighbor's wife, suffered a painful miscarriage, you get the picture. Heroically, though, Plath was able to channel all of her pain into bursts of genius poetic energy, and the crystallization of this is widely deemed to be her 1965 collection of poems, Ariel, which was posthumously published. The practice of drawing on private, personal details as material for writing is central to the confessional poetry movement, which emerged in 1950s America with the prominence of poets like Robert Lowell, and Sexton, and of course, Plath herself. In the poem Daddy, the speaker, who is presumably Plath, casts her father in a dark, traumatic light. But halfway into the poem, she shifts her characterization of the daddy into a man that is implied to be her husband, Hughes. Throughout the poem, there's a strong undercurrent of the Freudian notion of the Electra complex, which posits that daughters subconsciously seek out men who remind them of their fathers as their eventual romantic partners or husbands. And in this poem, both the father and the implied husband are portrayed to be sources of terror and abuse for the woman, who tries to struggle against their oppression, but at the same time finds herself pathologically attached to the pain that they cause her. So in the rest of this video, I'll be walking us through my analysis of the poem in four sections. So sit tight and let's get right into it. Right from the start, the speaker begins from a place of struggle and resistance. She protests, you do not do, you do not do anymore. But the repetition of you do not do suggests that her insistence on pushing back comes with concerted effort. The series of mixed metaphors that follows, comparing her father to a black shoe in which I have lived like a foot for 30 years, frames the looming influence of this paternal shadow as being both long-lasting and suffocating. Feet are supposed to live, or fit, within a shoe, but diminishing her identity into the simile of like a foot, poor and white, reinforces the obedience and submission that was, she was subject to. Indeed, as for the longest time, she was barely daring to breathe or achoo. The onomatopoeia of achoo allows for a glimpse of childlike authenticity, but this is quickly snuffed out by the macabre imagery in the next stanza. With the line, Daddy, I have had to kill you, the speaker abruptly seizes agency, or at least tries to do so only to reveal that you died before I had time. Plath's father, Otto Plath, died of gangrene when the poet was eight, and scholars have since agreed that this event would come to traumatize Plath for the rest of her short life. But for all the hatred that the speaker conveys in her murderous intention, the characterization of daddy is complex, marked by a contradictory mix of resentment and affection. He weighs on her soul as this all-powerful, sanctimonious presence, being so marble-heavy, a bag full of God, ghastly stature. Yet, this majestic, terrifying authority is promptly deflated with the somewhat whimsical, awkward simile of his one grey toe being big as a Frisco seal, with his head in the freakish Atlantic. The jarring juxtaposition of God and a seal conveys a dissonance in the speaker's perception of her father as being someone she at once fears and adores. Indeed, the ambivalence of her emotions is captured in the lyrical fusing of where it pours bean green over blue in the waters of beautiful Norset and the colour imagery of green morphing into blue symbolising a melding of disgust and melancholy perhaps paralleling the image of polluted seawater, which turns green with contamination. 
as the memory is set against the backdrop of what's possibly a happy childhood memory of the family spending a vacation on the Norset beach of Cape Cod in Massachusetts, which is where the illusion Norset refers to. By the way, guys, if you find this video helpful so far, I'd massively appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below and subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss out on any of my top grade lit study content going forward. I'd also encourage you to check out my membership program by clicking the join button below if you want exclusive access to members only study content and make special video requests. I'll see you there. Despite wanting to kill her father though, the speaker also used to, to pray to recover you signaling her conflict between feeling aversion and attachment to her father. The agonizing dichotomy expressed in the exasperation of ach du, which is German for oh you. Now Otto Plath, her father, was a professor of German and biology at Boston University. So it's possible to read Plath's incorporation of these German phrases into this tribute as the child's subconscious desire to impress her father despite also hating him at the same time. Now with the turn into stances four to seven, the Holocaust motif comes to the fore much more vividly, with the speaker alluding to the many wars, 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 which are later echoed with the harrowing allusion to Dachau, Auschwitz, Belsen which are the largest concentration camps for the extermination of Jews under Hitler's rule during the Third Reich. The father's dismissive demeanor is reflected in the lack of acknowledgement of the name of the Polish town that was scraped flat by the roller, Poland being one of the countries invaded by Hitler during World War II. The speaker recalls her paralyzing silence in front of the father, who is increasingly implied to be a Hitler-esque figure, her muteness, being a result of her fear in his presence. His physical cruelty is suggested in the phrase of, I never could tell where you put your foot, your root, and the metaphorical association she draws between her inability to speak, the tongue stuck in my jaw, with it stuck in a barbed wire snare, reinforces the palpable, traumatizing pain this chronic terror had caused her. In the ik, ik, Eek, eek sequence, which is German for I, 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 the stuttering rhythm and lexical hiccup may also be a reflection of the speaker's mental and emotional stuntedness. Just as she is unable to progress in speech, she struggles to move beyond or overcome the spectre of her father's hobbling influence. Even as she reaches adulthood, her I, self-identity, is stuck in a never-ending loop of averting back to her childhood self, denied release by the ever-present shadows of her dark memories. So what then is the speaker's identity if not defined in her own terms? In stanza seven, the speaker explicitly calls herself a Jew as the quintessential symbol of modern history's persecution and victimhood. The mechanical echoes of an engine and engine chuffing me off like a Jew, a Jew, perhaps parallel the obsessive replaying of violent childhood memories in the speaker's mind, with the connective anadiplosis of a Jew, a Jew to Dachau, Auschwitz, Belsen, suggesting that the experiences of her earlier life continues to impact her as she grows into an adult. Childhood suffering is often, after all, linked to adult neuroses. Unable to carve out her own selfhood, the speaker must inherit a historical one, as the syntactical paralleling and lexical repetition of like a Jew and may well be a Jew likewise convey the notion that the ch adult and the child are, at their core, the same person. Now, besides trauma and dark memories, though, what are the other effects of daddy's oppression on the speaker? Loss of innocence is a key one, symbolized by the plain-spoken but deeply poignant reference to the snows on the Tyrol, the clear beer of Vienna, are not very pure or true. So beneath the outward pristine of the Alps' white snow caps and the liquid clarity of a celebratory libation, what melts and bubbles underneath, though, is the dark human impulse of wanting to hurt and persecute those deemed different or weird which during Hitler's time would, of course, include Jews and the Romani people. The speaker identifies with these marginalized victims as one with gypsy ancestress and my tarot pack and my tarot pack, 
Specifically, the tautology of my tarot pack and my tarot pack is curious. And since tarot packs are known to be a fortune-telling device, this reiteration may signify a child's desperate hope for better luck that can relieve her of her constant muted suffering. Yet again, this relinquishes her power to an external force that she can never control. What's important to note, however, is that there is nuance even in the Hitler-esque characterization of the father. He is not wholly evil, and the speaker at points seems to lapse into a state of hazy affection for whom she openly labels as the brute, a devil and the black man. For instance, juxtaposing your Luftwaffe, your gobbledygoo, presents the father as both an intimidating military general who may nonetheless show his softer side when he speaks to his young children in gobbledygoo and baby talk. Similarly, his strict steeliness may be represented by your neat moustache, but there is an element of kindness implied in the bright blue of your eye and eye. He may be a German tank driver, a panzer man marked by a swastika so black no sky could squeak through. But rather than being entirely repulsed by his frightening, cruel persona, she retains a hint of emotional fondness for him, or at least attachment to him, as conveyed in the apostrophe of, oh, you. Despite acknowledging the harm that her father has done to her and his objectively abhorrent persona, she still misses him in a Stockholm Syndrome kind of way. And this longing for her father comes through on at least two levels. The first one being the nostalgic picture I have of you standing on the blackboard, which is presumably a photograph of Plath's father when he was teaching a class at Boston University. And the second level, though, is the Freudian one, which pertains to the electric complex theory I had mentioned at the start of this video. Specifically, this comes through when she says, every woman adores a fascist, the boot in the face, the brute, brute heart of a brute like you. Now, this is the first instance in the poem where the speaker relays a paradoxical and heartbreaking truth. Masochistically, we can be drawn to those who hurt us. In fact, for some people, the more abusive the other person, the more intense our attachment to them becomes. The speaker seems to want to universalize this impulse with the sweeping generalization of every woman adores a fascist, and the repetition of the brute, brute heart of a brute like you here could reflect the repetitive pattern of her own behavior against rational judgment the speaker seeks a duplicate version of her father in the man she eventually marries, as when she says, I made a model of you, in stanza 13. In the last stretch of the poem, the speaker's preoccupation shifts from her relationship with her father to that with her husband, who is portrayed as being just another Hitler-like figure, a man in black with a Mein Kampf look and a love of the rack and the screw, a man similarly given to cruelty, violence and abuse, albeit perhaps more emotional than physical, or both. There's a sense, though, that the speaker made the self-sabotaging decision of marrying such a problematic man because she comes from a broken place with a shattered self-identity, as after they pulled me out of the sack and they stuck me together with glue, I knew what to do, which was to say, I do, I do, i.e. get married to a man who abuses her. But just when it seems like the speaker is a defeated victim, being twice on the receiving end of terrifying oppression and cruelty, first from her father and then from her husband, the tone and circumstances pivot into a strong note of triumph towards the end, whereby she reclaims control and agency by retaliating against her oppressors, albeit only in her mind. The speaker claims if I've killed one man, I've killed two. But in reality, Plath herself suffered the sudden death of her father and was then cheated on by Hughes with his affair partner, Asia Weevil, which led to their subsequent divorce. The vampiric image of the husband having drank my blood for a year is probably a subtle nod at the duration of the underground affair that Hughes and Weevil had before Plath had found out about his infidelity. But the quick correction of seven years, if you want to know, acknowledges that Hughes and Plath's marriage, which lasted a whole of seven years, was really doomed from the get-go. In any case, by endowing her speaker with the power of revenge and resistance in the one domain she has absolute control over, poetry, art, and the text itself, 
Plath may be reimagining and rewriting herself as a stronger woman, one who would have had the courage to stand up for herself in the face of the men's mistreatment, abuse, and abandonment. The final residual unresolved angst against Daddy, Daddy, you bastard is captured in the gruesome scene of the villagers dancing and stamping on him, but this violence is perhaps equally directed towards herself. That stake in your fat black heart may be the speaker's imagined vengeance against her father, but the stake of her father and husband's damage really went through her in real life, despite her now claiming vocal and imaginary victory by insisting that, Daddy, I'm finally through. I am through. While she may literally have lived through those traumatic childhood and marital experiences, there remains the question of whether she's gained a real emotional breakthrough and liberated herself from the baggage. The fact that this poem concludes with four end rhymes of you, 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 through, and the recurrence of the word you seems, though, to suggest that she's still very much stuck in the loop, or at least stuck with the self-perception as a victim, subject to an endless cycle of what you, whether this you be Otto Plath the father or Ted Hughes the husband, will do to her. But instead of reading this ending as a reflection of Plath's inherent weakness or lifelong victimhood to this sort of self-sabotaging repetition compulsion, we can see it as a heroic, albeit deeply tragic and hugely challenging attempt at confronting past pain, of mentally reliving the traumatic process and channeling all the feelings of angst, sadness, disappointment and remorse into artistic creation as an expression of hope, even when there's no promise that the healing of the self can truly be obtained at the end of the journey. And there you have it, guys. By this point, I feel like I'm actually more plath strink than a literary critic, but I hope this analysis was helpful in giving you some insights into this complex poem. Daddy is a piece of writing that's at once painful, sad, heroic, confusing, chaotic, beautiful, and there's no easy way to pin it down then therein lies its power. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on the poem and how you interpret what Plath is trying to say and express through it. So anyway, leave a comment below if you have any thoughts. I'd love to hear. For your next video, I recommend that you watch my other poetry analysis video on T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which is another super important 20th century poem that's intriguing, disturbing, and affecting in equal measure. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button below so you can encourage me to keep making these useful English Lit Study videos for you and other passionate Lit learners all around the world. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my channel so you never miss out on my weekly videos going forward. You can also consider joining my membership program for exclusive video requests and essay review perks. Check that out in the description box below. And as always, I will see you guys in the next one. Bye!